Well, good evening, and we're going to welcome you today to our third Tuesday in the season of Advent. And again, we take a look at our Bible study, book of Isaiah, chapter 61. But we are again preparing for the season of Christmas. And so maybe your house right now is filled with Christmas baking, as mine is. My wife just loves making cookies. And this is one of her favorite things in preparation for the season. Maybe you've gone out and purchased a, a cut tree, a live cut tree, and you brought it into your home, and it just smells so wonderful. So the smells of Christmas are now filling our homes, but we are praying for the Spirit of God to enter into your hearts and fill your hearts so that not only prepared for Christmas Day, but for the life that God wants to give you. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for the seasons, the smells, the wonderful news of this Christmas season. And we just ask you continue to touch our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 61. You will recognize, or at least you should recognize, this passage. But let me start with a couple of things. Before we start reading it and you start figuring out where you've heard it before, not only obviously in the season of Christmas, but we hear this again. And actually, it's the beginning of Jesus' ministry that he reads this lesson in a synagogue, and you're going to hear it in just a moment. But the actual background of the book of Isaiah chapter 61, Israel, remember, let me get a different color here, Israel has just returned from Babylon. Now this, of course, filled quite a lengthy time of the Jews' history where again they were under threat. Northern Israel was destroyed by, by Assyria, and then of course they were on their own, and then came along the Babylonians who defeated them and took them into captivity and destroyed their cities. Remember we talked about that last week, that was the setting of Isaiah in the 40th chapter, how Isaiah again was prophesying to those folks who were caught in the destruction left after Babylon had gone, and they were just so depressed. So now they return from Babylon. Remember, I always mention to you the good guys in this case. Who are they again? Oh, that's right. They're folks from Iraq. The Persians came and defeated the Babylonians and allowed the Jews to return to their home country. Seems like a fantastic thing, right? So they are in the rebuilding phase. Everything was destroyed. They come back home. They find everything in shambles. So there's danger all around them. Some are probably even starting to wonder if slavery, if slavery for them was better than coming home. Because at least they had some autonomy. I mean, we think of slaves and how terrible our slaves were treated uh, in our country. That was not always the case, of course, in the ancient times. Slaves had a, but a bit more autonomy, and so they at least had plenty to eat. They had a good home in which they resided. They could fall in love with people. They weren't separated from their families after they were, of course, ripped out of Israel. So it might ne not necessarily have been the worst thing in the world compared to what they came home to. And so... Here they were yearning and yearning and yearning. Oh, we just want to go home. We just want to go home. We're tired of being slaves. They get home. Well, be careful what you wish for, right? It's kind of like making a wish with a genie. A genie's always out to get you, right? Oh, God, make me the desire of every woman, and then I become a Calvin Klein handbag or something. I don't know. Is that something everyone would want? Are there even Calvin Klein handbags? I have no clue. But the point is, is that a fast one is pulled on them. They go home, they think they really want to be home, they get home, and it's absolutely desolate. It is starting all over again, with enemies on every single side. And so with that in mind, this is the context of today's lesson. So I want you to keep that in mind as we start to read this, and in particular, we're going to look at it verse by verse, verse 1, you will recognize. So remember, I told you that Jesus read this verse at the beginning of his ministry, Isaiah chapter 61. The sovereign, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, 
to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. This is just, a, this is, oh, by the way, this is God's mission to the world. You know, it's very popular in churches to create what we call mission statements. It's stupid. Our church doesn't have one. We have a purpose statement because it's God's mission. I don't define the mission that we're on here in this world. It's whose mission? It's God's mission. God is on a mission to love and reconcile the world to him. And that's God's mission. I am just privileged to be a participant in it. I have a purpose within God's mission. But it's not my mission. It's God's mission. And so this is what we're supposed to be about, be, uh, be about as a church. It was Christ took this on. He said, this prophecy has been fulfilled this day in your hearing. So he said, he was referring to himself. I'm the one who's come from God to what again? Proclaim the good news to the poor. To bind up the brokenhearted. To proclaim freedom for the captives and relief. Release from darkness for the prisoners. Now, uh, to proclaim, oh, let me get this last verse. Second verse, to proclaim the year of our Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Oh, that's really interesting. So here's the thing. This is the mission of God, to reconcile the world. But you notice in verse 2, there's an egg that's going to have to be broken. And so he mentions the word vengeance. Because there is something that's keeping this mission from being accomplished. Now, I happen to believe when God talks about the poor, God is talking about the literal poor. And about those who are spiritually impoverished. Because they've been led astray by their religious leaders. So I think God always has that dual purpose in mind. The poor, the oppressed because they also represent those who have been oppressed oftentimes by religious leaders or people who are in power, okay? This is why they're physically poor, because they're also spiritually poor, because they have poor leadership. This is the way the Jews thought of it, and it's true. It is absolutely true. You know, I'm reminded when we think of the word poor, Blessed are the poor, and all the poor, and all the emphasis. This is one of the main emphases of the Bible, is how God wants to bless those who are poor, and is concerned over their plight, and especially in the Old Testament, this theme keeps coming up over and over again. It reminds me of Fiddler on the Roof, and Tevye, you remember if you've seen that musical, Tevye says, God, you must truly love the poor, because you've made so many of them. <laughs> right? This is again the theme over and over again, the poor. And God says that there is a nut that's got to be cracked. There's going to have to be some vengeance. But upon whom? Doesn't it seem like this blessed, wonderful day of the Lord, vengeance, doesn't it seem like an ox oxymoron? Well, this word vengeance is directed at who? Oh, I'm going to tell you. We've got to put it in green. rich and the powerful the rich and the powerful if we take the side of the rich and powerful at the expense of the poor we have become a part of the problem now I am warning you I am not talking politically in terms of our contemporary politics I happen to know people who believe that the poor need to be taken care of, but they believe that government intrusion in our politics is creating the poverty. Okay, well, there's an honesty. You can disagree with that perspective, but there's an honesty to that. Or you can be a person who believes that, yes, we need to confront the rich, but we need to do it in a political manner, and it needs to be a centralized response from our government. Okay. Those are two totally different perspectives, politically how to deal with the issues that are uh, causing the poverty in this country. But they're both honest opinions. 
that want to get to this, okay? I happen to think there's a balance there. We kind of need a both end, but that's just my opinion. It's not a biblical opinion. It's just an opinion. So we need to be careful of associating a particular form of politics with the right way of doing this. But make no mistake, we are responsible to make sure that the powerful and the rich are confronted because they have impoverished God's people, the people who are poor. Okay? It is one of our primary responsibilities as a church and as a people of God to proclaim the year of our Lord's favor, the day of vengeance upon the rich and the powerful. Now, I, that was my words right there. But you'll notice if you read the entire chapter, that's what he's referring to. To comfort those who mourn. Verse 3, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. How, listen to how beautiful this poetic language is. How wonderful. To provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. See, when people were in time of mourning, they put ashes on their head to represent the mourning through which they're going. It's time to clear that off. A day of celebration is announced. God is in control. Okay? Oil of joy, again. Oil, again, to make you look fresh and, and clean and silky and ready to go. Oil instead of mourning. A garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Garment of praise. Well, you know, oftentimes, again, when they're mourning, they wear sackcloth. Or if they're poor, they wore some of the, the worst types of, and the roughest type of, of, uh, of clothes that they, uh, because that's all they could afford, or that's all they could make. But here they've got a spirit, garment of praise. Hey, they're celebrating because, gosh, it just feels so comfortable. And God has provided for them. They will be called oaks of righteousness. A planting of the Lord. Okay, this is, again, verse 3. I really want to point out this. Listen to this. They will be called oaks of righteousness. Why? Because of something good that they've done. Again, he's talking about these impoverished poor people who've come back to Jerusalem, who seem like everything is over for them, and God is saying that they will be called, what again? Oaks of righteousness. That's meant to convey a very powerful image in your, your head. But listen to this next phrase, because it's nothing that they've done that earned it. A planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. Do you see how there's nothing in anything that they've done that's made them great? The whole point is, is God takes the poor, the impoverished, and does spectacular things because God is then glorified by proving that God overcomes the power, the money, the greedy of this world. And God does something spectacular by lifting up the poor out of their poverty. Let's go on. Verse 4. <clears throat> oh, boy. I hope you're having fun. I am. They will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will restore the palaces. The place is long devastated. They will renew the cities, the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. So God is going to plant them, but then they are going to rebuild. God will give them everything that they need so that they can build something beautiful again. And we're going to skip down to verse 8. For I, the Lord, love Justice. Ooh. Okay. Warning bells here. Justice. The Bible often talks about justice, but this is not this is not social justice. See, in our country, in particular, some Christians want to say, well, we're doing God's justice when we do social justice. No, you're not. Social justice is not God's justice. And God's justice, God sits on the throne in the middle of our hearts, in our country. That doesn't happen here in the United States or in any secular political system or ism. And I don't think we'd want a Christian system because we'd say, who's Christianity anyway? Whose view of Christianity 
Social justice is not God's justice because it isn't about God sitting on the throne. That's a political club that people will beat you to tell you you don't fit in with them because you don't agree with them and their political perspectives. It's not social justice. Doing social justice is not doing the justice of God. Now, I'm not saying that this is necessarily wrong. Because there are some cases where there needs to be a social justice or recompense in our country because we have done the wrong things towards people who are black, people who are poor, people who are Latinas, immigrants to this country, or those trying to get to this country. We see ourselves as a, a beacon on a hill in the United States of America, and yet we turn people away who are desperately want to be here. Well, those things don't match. We don't match what we say we are. So yeah, I think there needs to be some type of social justice, but don't confuse this with God's justice. It is not the same thing. We are not doing God's work. Well, we can't be, but this is not the same as this. Okay? I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery, wrongdoing. Uh, again, when rich people, that's the target of this, when powerful people set up a system that serves them at the expense of other people, that's the original sin. That's exactly what happened in Genesis 1. And yes, it happens in the United States of America. It happens in every country. But I can't do anything about Canada. I can't do anything about Mexico. I can't do anything uh, about Egypt, and I can't do anything about France or Germany, but I can do something about our country. And yes, it is true that the rich and the powerful turn the tables for themselves, and it works against the poor. So there are some, so, there are some social inequities created by the fact that we create systems that keep certain people in their place. Okay? You know, let me, uh, let me just historically say this. This is a, an issue that's very passionate. I'm very passionate about this, and we should be as Christians. In uh, the 1800s, in the United States of America, after the slaves were freed by Abraham Lincoln, what were they freed to? And for what? Nobody would give them jobs. They weren't permitted to own land in many places. They didn't have money to be able to purchase land. They couldn't create wealth. So they were freed for what? Well, the system benefited white Americans at the expense of our brothers and sisters who are black for another hundred years. Black folks had to find a way, that's why they made their own schools, their own education institutions, because the NAACP and educational organizations and the black community said, we need to make sure that there are historic black schools so that our black young men and women can get a leg up and maybe have a chance to succeed in this country. It was hard because everything was against them. There was nobody there helping them. They had absolutely nothing. You say, well, I grew up poor. You didn't grow up like this poor. You didn't. The, the deck was stacked against them. Okay? See, white folks were carrying all the kings, all the queens, all the jacks, all the aces, everything that was of value. And they had all the ones and twos and threes, and that's it. And there was no way to get out of that system. So yes, there are some systemic things and issues that create this injustice, and these are the things the Bible is concerned about this. Justice needs to be done. We need to free the impoverished. We go on, verse 9. The descendants of mine will be known amongst the nations. Their offspring bring amongst the peoples. All will see and acknowledge them. 
They are the people, and the Lord has blessed them. Okay, again, who's the one that's blessed? God has. It's not their activity that creates the blessing. See, we got this stupid saying, I've got to pick myself up by my own bootstraps. That is the dumbest phrase I've ever heard of. I'm serious. Try to pick yourself up by your own bootstraps. You can't. It is the dumbest image I've ever heard. God picks us up. And God plants us. That's why we can be successful. And so therefore, verse 10, I will greatly delight in the Lord. My soul will rejoice in my God. Do you see the difference between social justice and God's justice? God is at the center of it. God is not at the center of social justice. Now, that's a relative justice, and it might be the best that we can accomplish on this earth. Fine. But don't argue that it's God's justice. God has a different vision. Release the poor, God, because God is the one who's releasing the poor, and God is the one at the center of things. Can't happen in a secular country. I will, greatly, I will delight greatly in the Lord, verse 10 again. My soul rejoices in my God. He has clothed me with garments of salvation. Again, there's a beautiful image. Garments of praise, garments of salvation. How beautiful. Arrayed me in a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom adores his head like a priest as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all the nations. Again, it is God who does it. And so here's what I would like to tell you, and I think what we are supposed to hear. When we are in a season of despair... And we are indeed. God promises amidst that despair to grow up a mighty tree. You know, when we first came to East Pittsburgh, one of the things we noticed is not a lot of trees, not a lot of grass, it's all concrete. It was kind of depressing. We came from a rural area prior to this. And my wife made a comment. She said, you know what? I was so depressed about this, and she saw in one of the cracks, in one of her sidewalks at the church, a flower sprouting forth from it. It's probably a daisy, something like that. But she realized how faithful God is, even in this concrete jungle, to raise a sprout, something green. Growth continues to happen. God cannot be stopped. It is God that brings the growth. It's not our activity. It's not our repentance. It's not something we've done. God is always faithful. In the places where it looks like there's no hope and no opportunity to raise up something spectacular. Oh, the seeds are grown. The green is starting to sprout forth again. Because God is in control. Let us pray. Holy Father, we thank you again for your many, 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 many blessings. It's easy to overlook them in the time that we're going through right now. Especially since there are so many people who are impoverished. And God, there are those who are impoverished because of the season through which we're going. They just do not have the resources to care for themselves. It is our job... It is our calling because it's the mission of God to feed the poor, to clothe the naked, to take care of the prisoners and those who've been oppressed. It's your mission. And we are so privileged to be a part of that mission. So help that to be our overriding theme as the Church of Jesus Christ. But God, we also ask you to help us as we grow to understand that it is you that brings the growth. Give us hope and courage in this season. For you ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, go and prepare for Christmas. I hope you have a great joy this Christmas season. And I look forward to seeing you this Sunday for worship on this YouTube channel and also next Tuesday 
God's blessings to you.